Welcome to First United Methodist Church Richardson Online. I'm Kevin Burns, Communications and Media Associate here at FUMCR. If you joined us for worship last month, you can tell that we're back from our camping in the woods, and here we are in the beautiful sanctuary of FUMCR. Today, we begin a new worship series called This Is My Song, where we talk about songs in music that have impacted our faith. Today, we have an opportunity to participate in the Sacrament of Communion in our worship services, both in person and online. As United Methodists, we have an open table, which means anyone who would like to participate is welcome to do so. For some, taking communion at home may be new or feel a bit strange. I want to encourage you to participate in whatever way feels most comfortable and authentic for you in your faith journey. Take a moment to create a special sacred space in your home to receive the sacrament. All you need is a small piece of bread or a cracker with some juice or water for each person who will be participating. Now, as we prepare for worship, please join me in reading these verses from Scripture. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to cheer and to guide 
Claire, worship coordinator and children's choir teacher here at FUMCR. Today I'm in the sanctuary, which is where we hold our traditional worship services on Sundays. And I'm in here because I have something really cool I want to show you. It's the hymnal. You might be thinking, Miss Claire, that's just a book. And you're right, but this book has really cool things in it that I want to share with you. So this was written a couple hundred years ago by men and women, pastors and lay people, all with the idea of community building around music centered on God's word. And there's so much in this book that I wanna share with you, but the first thing is we have to know how to use it. So let's open up and find Jesus Loves Me, which is hymn number 191. Now you might be looking for a page number, but what we're actually looking for is this bold number in the top left-hand corner, 191, and the title says, Jesus Loves Me. And if you were to look over here, 192 is this hymn. Let's focus over here. Next, you're gonna see one, two, three, one, two, three. And you would think that we would read them in this order and then go down, but that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna read the top line on this line and go down and read the top line of this group of words as well. We'll go back up to the top, read the second line all the way through, and then read the third line all the way through. In this song, we know that it doesn't end just when we get to he is strong, right? We're gonna go to this fancy word called the refrain. That is gonna act as a buffer in between our verses. So we'll sing one verse, and then we'll sing, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, before we go into the next verse. But sometimes we don't know the words, sometimes we don't know the song. So all you need to do this week, you don't need to focus on the music notes quite yet. You can just listen along and see if you can catch on, or you can practice just reading the words, praying with those words, or even saying them out loud like poetry, and we can figure out the music another day. So, after we've learned how to use the hymnal, I hope that this week, if you go visit a friend's church or you come visit us, if there's a hymnal somewhere near you, I hope that you take it, flip through a couple pages, and find a song that resonates with you. It might be a song that you keep with you for the rest of your life. But I promise you, wherever you are and whenever you find this hymnal, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for that wonderful children's moment, Miss Claire. And we love that you teach us about our faith. And if you have questions about faith or a church, or if you want to let us know some things that are going on in your life, I hope that you'll text to connect and let us know those things so that we can be walking with you on this journey together. My name is Allison Jean, and I am the pastor of Modern Worship here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. I'm so glad that you've joined us for another experience of worship as we begin a new series, This Is My Song, exploring the great hymns of our faith. So as we join together in studying scripture, would you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, may the words I speak 
and the meditations on all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock, our redeemer, our savior of the world. Amen. One of my absolute favorite team building exercises in life is karaoke. If you have a new friend that you want to get to know better, karaoke is the best avenue to do it because there's just something about scream singing into a microphone that makes life better and more fun and makes you feel connected to the person that you're with. But have you ever had the experience of thinking of a favorite song that you've never really listened to the lyrics that well to before and you put it up to sing that song together and then you realize it's not actually about what you think it's about? <laughs> Like the wonderful time when my husband very sweetly decided that he would serenade me with Isn't She Lovely by Stevie Wonder. Except that's not a romantic song. That's actually about Stevie Wonder's daughter being born. And we discovered this as Cameron was singing it to me. Sometimes when we think about the meaning of songs, we realize that they are entirely different than what we originally expected. Or we realize how much deeper the meaning is than we could appreciate before. That's really the hope for this entire series as we're exploring the great hymns of our faith. I've sung these songs from our hymnal throughout my entire life. I'm a lifelong Christian. And so I take for granted the words of amazing grace and great is thy faithfulness and there is a balm in Gilead because I've heard them forever. How many times do we actually stop to think about what it is that we're singing, what it is that we're declaring with our music about God and about ourselves and about our faith. So as we are exploring all of these songs, the hope is that we will dive deeper and appreciate them all the more when we sing them together. And this week, we're looking at Great Is Thy Faithfulness. It's a top hit hymn. A lot of people request it and love it very dearly. It's one of my favorites too. And as we dig into where these hymns come from, we'll notice that a lot of them actually start with scripture. The writer of the hymn is reading scripture and is inspired by the word of God to write a poem or to write a piece of music that ends up in our hymnals. And Great Is Thy Faithfulness is no different. It actually starts out though in a scripture that you might not expect. It's from Lamentations. Now, Pastor Sarah, who's on our staff, is the only person that I think I've ever heard who actually has said, I love Lamentations. I think most people feel about Lamentations the way they feel about Leviticus. It's not a top hit request of Bible studies from the congregation because it's really a sad book. I mean, the title kind of tells us everything, Lamentations which comes from the word lament. Now that's a pretty churchy word, and if you're unfamiliar with it, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as a powerful expression of grief or sorrow. Now this is not just a process of expressing sadness outwardly, but lamenting is actually meant to accomplish something as well. One biblical scholar that I read this week uh, defined it as lamenting accomplishes processing and protesting. When we lament something in our lives or something in the bigger world that we live in, we are processing grief and we are protesting against the darkness. That is really what we're trying to do. And that's what the writer of Lamentations is trying to do. And that's because a tragedy has actually happened to this person. They're witnessing to an invasion from an army from Babylon coming into the city of Jerusalem. Now in early Israel life, Jerusalem is the central hub of commerce, sure, and culture, yes, but Jerusalem is so much more than just an important city. Jerusalem is the place where the temple is. And in early Jewish faith, the temple is precisely where God has chosen to live. It's the place where they can come into the presence of God, where they can connect most deeply and most fully with God, to practice their faith, to become more and more the people that God hopes for them to be. And so when Babylon comes into Jerusalem and destroys the city, they also destroy the temple. And so it's not just 
buildings and money and property that are lost, the people are devastated because the place where they connect with God is lost. It's destroyed. It is abandoned. And that's what makes these words in Lamentations all the more incredible. The writer is not just witnessing to a faith in good times, but the writer is witnessing to faith in the midst of chaos and suffering and tragedy. Just listen to these words. I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. It's a very quotable scripture, and I'm sure that it was wonderful to hear at the beginning of this service, but it's even more meaningful when we know the full picture of what is happening. One biblical scholar said, hope and despair co-inhabit the writer's inner world. And so we find that in the midst of this tragedy, the entire book of Lamentations is a witness to this person processing his grief, speaking out loud the things that are happening within him as he is dealing with all that has gone on. When tragedies happen in our world, a lot of times that processing happens behind closed doors because we have the wonderful gift of counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists and caring people who come in to help people process the grief of what's happened. But here, the writer has decided to testify to that processing through lamentations. But it's not just the processing of grief, but it is an act of protest as he is walking in the midst of rubble and destruction, he digs up hope and faith. I love one scholar digs into the Hebrew of this text because our Bibles were not originally written in English. And so sometimes you have to dig into the language of the original text a little more to get to the deeper meaning behind it. And the scholar says that another clearer meaning for this in 321 is this I cause to come back into my heart, therefore I have hope. That within the Hebrew language, there is this sense of will, that this writer has willed this hope and faith to rise up in the midst of the rubble of Jerusalem, in the devastation of what has happened. And so it's no wonder that this scripture was so meaningful to Thomas Chisholm, who wrote Great is Thy Faithfulness, because he was dealing with his own tragedy. He had a life where he lived through the tragedy of World War I and World War II. So those bigger devastations, of course, happened around him. But he also faced personal difficulty. He felt a call from God to become a pastor. And so he became a Methodist minister, in fact but only for a year of his life because he dealt with what a lot of loved ones that we know, or even maybe you do, the reality of chronic illness. So the rest of his life was shaped by the limitations of his health and things that prevented him from living the life that he thought he was going to live. So he moved his family, he tried to take up a different career, one that he didn't feel called to, but instead he found a way to serve God by writing over 1,200 poems, 800 of which were published, many of which were attesting to his faith in God. And Great is Thy Faithfulness is the most famous of all of those. And when we know that context of this hymn writer story, it makes it all the more powerful to read these words. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Everything in his life had changed. 
Nothing about his life was something that he had chosen for himself, but instead it was shaped by his own physical limitations and the world that he lived in and how they responded to those limitations. And in the midst of that, in the midst of all of this change that he did not choose, he attests to the fact that God doesn't change, that God's faithfulness is constant, never ending, that the one thing that he could count on in the midst of even his own body failing him was God's faithfulness. And the message he shares in this hymn is that God's faithfulness sustains us. In that act of will, of hoping, of digging up hope and faith in the midst of the rubble of his life, this scripture also has another interesting aspect in that the Hebrew word for hope is the exact same word for wait. We think of those as two different activities that are separate from each other, and we assume that if we hope enough, then God will act immediately. But Chisholm lived his whole life with this illness. His hope was not for this world, but for the eternal. And so how did he move day in and day out, dealing with his life, the changes he did not choose? He looked for hope in every place he could. Listen to this second verse, summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. When he had to face day in and day out the unchanging difficulties of his life, he found hope in things like sunrises and sunsets. The relentlessness of God's faithfulness is reflected in the very relentlessness of nature. Winter does not last. Spring will come. Dead things will live again. He finds processing and protesting within the words of this hymn naming the reality that life is difficult, but we can dig up faith and hope out of the rubble of tragedy around us and protest against that darkness to say, this will not have the last word. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and 10,000 beside. We sing these hymns because even though this was written almost a century ago, it still has so much power and meaning for us. This song is one of my favorites, but it really didn't become my favorite hymn until everything fell apart in our lives. Some of you know, if you listen to our More Than Sunday podcast, that my son Calvin was born and um, we thought he was healthy and uh, had all the typical markers of a growing baby. And when he was one month old, we found ourselves in a doctor's office uh, being told he had a heart condition and that he was actively dying. And we had no idea. So we spent eight hours in chaos. If you've ever had a day like this, you know that doctors and nurses flood into the room when you finally get into a hospital room and they're setting up machines and medications and monitors and all of the things to tell them, how is this patient doing? And so Cameron and I just had to sit on a couch in the back of the room and watch as these medical professionals cared for our one month old in ways that we couldn't. And we waited and waited for everything to kind of quiet down. And it finally did after a full day. And then visiting hours were over and only one of us could stay with him. And so as we waited to hear if he was going to have surgery, as we watched him have all of these different things attached to his body to monitor how he was doing, Cameron 
had to say goodbye. And if you've ever stayed in the hospital, you know that there's a point around shift change when new staff comes in and the day staff leaves and someone comes in to check on you, make sure everything's fine, and then everything just kind of settles. The nurses go to their stations for the night and they turn down the lights and I found myself in a room alone with my one month old, not knowing what was gonna happen, knowing he was sick, knowing that his life was very much at risk and the darkness almost overwhelmed me. I didn't know what to do. And in that moment, the words of greatest thy faithfulness came into my head. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. I didn't have the will to dig up hope and faith in that moment as I looked at the rubble of our lives. But the voices of my parents singing this hymn over me as a child and the chorus of my home church congregation proclaiming, great is thy faithfulness. The voices of my grandparents who took me to their home church came into my mind and I knew that that hospital room was filled with the faithfulness of God. I didn't have time to process that would come much later. But in that moment, I was able to protest against the darkness, to lament what was going on, but also proclaiming that I knew God was there. And now Calvin is healthy and happy and growing as any almost two-year-old should and running around all over our house. And on those nights when I am exhausted from parenting or overwhelmed from work or the tragedies of our world, I still find myself singing, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. And even in this act of worship, when we gather together in this place, in this special way online, this is a protest against the darkness. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus protested against the darkness that could overwhelm us. He protested by breaking bread, by offering it to his disciples and saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. And out of the rubble of the sinfulness and brokenness of humanity, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So today, as you receive these elements of communion, as you serve one another by saying, this is the body of Christ, which is given for you, and this is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. May we all know that we are protesting, protesting against the darkness of this world and naming God's never-ending faithfulness that continues even to this day in this gift of grace. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us in the celebration of hymns. We hope you found inspiration and encouragement through the music and messages shared today. Wherever you are and whenever you find this video, we hope that you are blessed and encouraged. If you aren't feeling connected to a church home right now, we want you to know that FUMCR Online Community is a place for anyone, at any time, for any reason, and we'd love to connect with you to pray for you or just to say hi. Text us anytime at the number on the screen. If you'd like to support the mission and ministries of FUMCR, a quick and easy way is to like this video and subscribe to the FUMCR YouTube channel. 
By liking this video, it will help others find this worship service who may not otherwise see it. You can also support FUMCR by giving at the link on your screen. If you're interested in learning more about officially becoming a member of FUMCR or you're ready to take this step, we encourage you to text us at the number on your screen or visit fumcr.com join. Becoming a member of our faith community is a commitment to grow in your relationship with God, to support and encourage one another, and to be a light in the world. Whether you're near or far, we welcome you to be a part of our faith family. Thank you again for joining us in worship today. May your week be filled with joy and the melody of faith.